I need your help this morning. All of us come to Sunday morning gathering at the church with this heap of concerns on our heart and on the top of our mind. We can categorize some of them as um, anxious thoughts, worries. Um, but I want to tap in. I, I need your help. I want to tap into what you might be dealing with now in the form of questions. Just n- not like I didn't know or what's that add up to um, kind of questions, information-based questions. But the kind of question you're asking right now, perhaps like, what do I do in this situation? Perhaps it's a relationship. Perhaps it's, how do I talk to that person about this? Perhaps it's, how do I talk to a family member about parenting? Perhaps you are a parent and you're thinking, how do I parent my child, especially my teenager, perhaps, in this situation? Maybe you're an HR person at a tech company and you have policies on one side, you have rules and uh, things on this side, but you're operating in between and you need to know really what to do. I would like your help this morning by just thinking for a moment about three of those questions that you're asking. Could you identify those? You probably don't have to work very hard to identify those that are heavy on your heart or that's the top of mind for you. Identify three of those questions. They're not simple. Um, They're they're not just solved by Wikipedia search um, or or a quick trip down the street. They're, They're complicated. They're nuanced. They're difficult. Can you identify those three things? They may be relational, maybe work-related. What I'd like to do is take a walk with Paul today as we end our series in this section, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. And as we walk with him, I want to hear his voice um, in the scriptures because what he's going to tell us might help you answer those questions. It might help you walk well in those really complicated and nuanced areas where it's not just simple black and white, yes or no, go or stay, A or B. It's not just following the rules. It's not just applying the law. Um, It's somewhere outside of that. And it's a difficult place. And um, that's what I'd like to do today. So if you've got your Bibles, um, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to have a good time. Hopefully, we're going to see um, what Paul says as he ends this section, this middle section, um, roughly about idolatry. Um, it begins that way. It ends that way. There's a, a, a bit of a detour in the middle, but he's wrapping it all together. And I'd like to just remind you where we've been. Uh, and then we're going to dig into our text and walk through it slowly. That's our plan this morning. I hope you're in for it. I'm very excited about it. Um, and so in Corinth, which is very, very similar to King County, very, very similar to Seattle, very similar to Houston, where I'm from, it's not ancient in its culture or its problems, only in, in its location, right? Um, it, it's not ancient in any way that's irrelevant to us. And so can you imagine this very cosmopolitan city, multiple languages, multiple religions, temples everywhere, very, very international for that area of the Mediterranean, high traffic, high travel, um, high influence, high wealth. Paul comes, plants a church, people believe in Jesus And there's a small group that gets to be a medium-sized group that probably gets to be a pretty large group over a very short amount of time. And they're struggling. They're struggling with how to follow Jesus well in the culture. In this section, the particular question is this. There's a group of people in the church that say this. Oh, we are free in Jesus. And the truth has set us free, and we are free indeed. That means that we have certain rights and privileges. And these rights and privileges allow me to kind of do whatever I want because Jesus set us free. And so going to idol feasts in the temple like we used to do, not a problem, because idols are nothing. Idols are meaningless, and therefore feasts in idol temples are meaningless. We're all good. It has no bearing at all, no relevance at all to my walk with Jesus because Jesus has set us free from all those things. 
And Paul comes in in chapters 8, 9, and 10 of the book that we're studying and says, false. Those things are realities and they do have consequences. He says, an idol is not meaningless. An idol is nothing at all, he says in chapter 8, in the sense that it is not a rival to our God. An idol is not a rival God like God's arm wrestling. Who's going to win? No. But an idol is a spiritual reality. And he will tell us in our text today that they are demons. This is real stuff. And so Idols are not meaningless. Idols are dangerous. And going to feasts in idol temples is completely inconceivable as a believer. Don't go Princess Bride on me. I know what the word means. All right. It's inconceivable because it's incompatible with oneness with Jesus is what he's going to say. Now, he's already set up that idea in chapter eight. You cannot go to a feast in a temple. What he's going to do now in our text is set up and um, illustrate a different scenario for us that's more complex, that's more nuanced. It's not a simple yes or no, black or white, A or B, go or stay. It's somewhere outside of that. And that's where many of our decisions live. Those three decisions that you've identified top of mind, that's likely where they live. And what Paul is going to want to do is walk with us and tell us how to manage those well, how to manage those in the way that God would want us to manage those, okay? So the Corinthians are really struggling because we have this group, Christ has set us free, I have rights and privileges, I can do what I want. Paul says, no, Christ has set you free, but that freedom should be guided by love, for God and for the other person, for those around you. And that love should lead you to serve and edify them, to build them up. What you're doing is actually ruining and destroying um, people's uh, walk and intimacy with God, right? And so there are three things coming together in our text today. The last bit of preface, but if you understand the argument of the Corinthians, if you understand the warning of Paul, and you understand these three things, the the text is pretty simple that we're going to read today. It, It decodes itself. If you don't understand these things, the text can be a little weary. You're like, wait, what's he talking about? Where's he coming from? That's why I'm spending so much time um, up front decoding it for you, okay? So here's what Paul is going to say and has already been saying for several chapters. You're dealing with a couple of things here, Corinthians, and so us reach King County, Seattle area today. Same thing. You're dealing first with the truth of the gospel. Jesus has set you free. You have the moral code written on your hearts, which is the law of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit of God in you as a seal of your secure salvation, never to be snatched out of my hand, Jesus says in John 10, nor snatched out of my Father's hand. You have the truth. Second, you have the reality of spiritual forces of darkness in this world that are the realities behind those idols. Those are demonic things. And we want you to live in the truth, but the reality of the city and the world you live in is there's the thinnest of veils between what we can see And what we cannot see, the unseen realm that is happening in the spiritual realities all around us all the time. And he says, there are darkness and demons behind those idols. And when you engage with them, it's inconceivable because it's incompatible with the life of a follower of Jesus. So we have the truth, then we have the reality of the world uh, that we live in. They come crashing together in this collision of confusion and complexity. And he says, and then uh, lastly, the third thing, I want to point all of this collision in the direction of mission to the lost outside the church and to the weak, young brothers and sisters inside the church. Truth, the reality of darkness in the world that we live in come colliding and crashing together and then he's going to sharpen it and point it towards the other person in mission. That's our text today and it is gorgeous. Really, really 
applicational. So we're hopefully going to spend a good amount of time equipping you, equipping each other with some great ways to perhaps answer those questions that you identified at the beginning of our time together and hold, uh, are holding in your heart and mind. We're going to get back to those, okay? Let's read our text. Chapter 10, starting in verse 14, excuse me, all the way through chapter 11, verse 1. That's actually the break in the subject. 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 are the victim of one of the more unfortunate chapter breaks in the New Testament. Uh, they didn't get it quite right. Um, you know, these are not original. These were put in in the 1500s, relatively new, on the landscape of the scriptures. Uh, most of the time they get it really great, and this time they didn't, okay? So they were one verse off. Um, let's read chapter 10, verse 14 and on. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? All things are lawful. Mm, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If any one of the believers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this meat is sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you, and for conscience' sake. I mean, not your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the prophet of the many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Heavy ending. Be imitators of me, as I imitate Christ. Can you say that? I need you to note you should be able to. Sounds arrogant, doesn't it? It's a little arrogant for Paul to say. Imitate me as I imitate Jesus. It is qualified, but it's the only qualification that matters. Paul does not say, do what I do. He says, do what I do as I do what Jesus does. Can you say that? If you're a parent, can you say that to your kids? It's really important for parents to be able to do because that's how God has set it up. You know why God gave kids to parents and God gave parents to kids so that both we'll learn how to love and trust him more. Parenting's hard. How does a kid learn how to trust and love and obey an invisible incorporeal God? They learn how to love and trust and obey a visible and corporeal parent. That's how God has set it up. You are not God, but God has put you in his place in a role of mother and father in the home. And you should be able to look to your kids and say, do as I do, as I follow Jesus. Not what my grandmother, God love her and I do love her, used to say when she would smoke in bed. Do as I say, not as I do. You know, I was like, I don't understand that, mamma. It doesn't make sense to me, you know. Um, we can't say that. Paul doesn't say that. Do as I say, not as I do. He says, no, examine my life and imitate me. Can you say that? Can you say that to your coworkers? Can you say that to your friends, to your siblings, to your neighbors? 
It is an, not an arrogant statement, and it's never done perfectly. Paul doesn't do it perfectly. I don't do it perfectly, but I should be able to say that, and I can't say that as a pastor. With fear and trembling, I can say that because you need to be able to say that. Otherwise, you live as a hypocrite, and we don't want that. Can you say what Paul said? That's how he ends, strong ending. Let's go back to the beginning because what he's going to um, illustrate for us is where many of these questions live. Now recall, he's already set up in chapter eight the inconceivability of going and feasting at a temple in a, a, an idol sacrifice ceremony. He has said that is not what you are going to do and what you should do. There is never a justification, oh, it's okay for me to go as this small group of the church is going to, right? Never a justification for that. He says, no, never, no. That's a demonic thing. It's inconceivable and incompatible. No, answer, no. There's never, uh, well, what if this, no, no. What if it falls on the fourth Tuesday of the month when it's, no, no. What if it's a new moon and my wife is gone? No, 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 never. That's black and white. But what he's setting up now is, very, very different. And this is where many of the choices that we have to make live. It lives in the area of wisdom. He says, okay, so that food and meat and vegetables that are sacrificed at that altar, it typically did three things. Some first part of it is burned up in the sacrifice. The second part is eaten and shared in the feast that you are not allowed to go to as a follower of Jesus. The third part is given into the market, the agora of Corinth, which I've walked around uh, several times. It's wonderful. I hope you get to go someday. Uh, a good portion of it is uncovered, and it is very, very large, surrounded by market stalls, um, the greatest um, preserved public restroom in all of ancient Near East. It's amazing. Um, a little gross, but amazing. Um, and you can walk ar around there. And so this is where you would go and get your food, your vegetables, your bread, all the things that you needed to survive. It's not just a marketplace. It's like the center of social life of the city. And he says, um, when you go to the market to buy meat, buy meat. Meat is meat. Buy and eat, he says. Don't ask where it came from. But he says, if someone tells you, you sit down at someone's house for a meal, they're, they're inviting you over. Notice that unbelievers, we'll get to that, unbelievers are inviting believers over to their house. That's a really good thing. Does that happen now? <laughs> I hope it does. I hope it does. You heard from Charlie and Kelsey about how they're living out their mission in their neighborhood. I hope Unbelievers are inviting you to their house to eat, and you are inviting them because that's how it should be. Um, and so he says, but when an unbeliever does and says, oh, this meat is sacrificed to an idol, then it's different. You see, this is not black and white, often off or on, A or B, go or stay. This lives in an area of wisdom, and that's what he wants to talk about. And he's going to make that case, Okay. Um, this is really, really important for us to understand because this is where much of our life and decision-making happens. And so let's look back at the text. Therefore, verse 14, my beloved, flee from idolatry. What does he call the church there? Beloved. He only does that twice. Once in chapter four, which we saw, and here. I think it's unique and it's beautiful. He is appealing to them. As a father, but as a brother, he loves them. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. This is not a game you want to play. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. And it does have consequences in your intimacy with God, in your search for the reward of the prize at the judgment seat of Christ. It will interrupt those things in your life, and those are very important. It is consequential. My beloved, flee. Watch what he says. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. That judge what I say is not like, you judge whether it's right or wrong. It's like, no, you judge that what I'm saying is true. But notice, I speak to you as to wise women and men. He's not being ironic or sarcastic. He's saying you are wise. He's already called them wise. And that becomes the theme of this really entire passage. 
walking in wisdom. Wisdom. That's hard to define. It's even harder to live out. I hope you know that wisdom is not the same as knowledge. Just because you're very smart does not mean you're wise. In fact, fools with knowledge are often the worst kind of fools because they think that they're wise because of what they know. How does one gain wisdom? One does not gain wisdom with collecting birthdays. You know old people that are not wise. I know older people that should be but aren't. And it's rare, but I know really young people that have a significant level of wisdom that is shocking and surprising and lovely. So it doesn't come with age, doesn't come with experience, it doesn't come with intelligence or knowledge. How is wisdom gained and what is it? When I was in seminary at Dallas Theological Seminary, um, I was in an academic ministries track because at, at that time I thought I was going to go do my PhD and become a professor and all of those things. I just love the classroom. I still love the classroom. And so I was following some of my professors around. Uh, and one of them, I sort of served as a TA and he's a prince of a man. He's with Jesus now. I loved, loved, loved this man. Um, and he was teaching an Old Testament class at the time, and I was helping them, him, and he had an accident in his uh, shoulder and had to have surgery. He had surgery one week. The next week, it was class time, and he says, Scott, I'm going to be a class, but I'm going to be on heavy medication. I was like, okay, this ought to be fun. He goes, no, um, I need you to teach the class. And I was like, well, what? He's like, it's, you know, it's a block scheduled class. So it was like a three, three and a half hour class with one break in the middle. And uh, you can do it. I'll help you. And I'm like, okay, uh, what's, what's slated for that class? He goes, oh, it's easy. The whole book of Proverbs. Uh, <laughs> what? He goes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just 31 chapters. I was like, the, the, whole, the whole thing? He goes, yeah, yeah, we can do this. And I'm like, I don't know if we can do this. You're going to be high, and i am never done this before, you know? And so... Um, he worked with me. He was such an amazing guy. He was there. He was not high. He was there in the back giving me great support. But um, I remember working on this for a very long time. And I remember my definition of wisdom. Can I share it with you? Because it is wise, let me tell you. Here is how I defined wisdom. Competency in the complexities of life. You can write that down. I know it will bless you. And it is completely meaningless. I was so excited to teach my first seminary class and share my great wisdom with all of the blessed people that happened to be there that day. And the way I defined wisdom is competency in the complexities of life. I would submit to you that's probably accurate, but completely useless. What is wisdom? Yes, it lives in those nuanced areas of life, not in the moral code, not in the law where it is right or wrong, yes or no, black or white, A or B, go or stay. It's that simple, obedience area. It doesn't live there. Of course, it, it influences that, but it generally lives in the gray area. Please pardon the phrase, don't, don't push that too far. It lives outside of that clear moral, the clear yes or no. So it does live in the complexities of life, but... It has something that's beyond knowledge, something that's beyond intelligence, that's beyond uh, age, uh, experience, all these things that helps you navigate the complex areas of life. In many ways, it may be like jazz music. I'm a fan of music. I'm a fan of great jazz, although I don't listen to a lot of it. But here, I had some friends who are great jazz musicians, and here's how you become a great jazz musician, truly. It's like you're a piano player, jazz piano player. Three easy steps. One, memorize all of the scales forward and backward where you can play them without a hint. You can play them in your sleep. Second, you memorize all of the book of jazz, that is the great jazz songs forward and backwards um, where you can play them in your sleep. Third, you memorize all of those songs in every possible key. And when you do that, you're a great jazz musician and you can show up at any jazz club 
any night of the week, and the lead player will say, let's do Count Basie, this song, in E flat. And you're like, great, I'm ready to go. And that's why great jazz musicians seem to flow so effortlessly. They can play and live in between, and that's what makes that special kind of music become unique, uniquely alive. There is years and years of hard work behind that. Wisdom is a bit like that. It's years and years of hard work, seeking, praying, walking with Jesus, so that when the moment comes, I can riff wisely in the complexities of life. I can walk how Jesus would walk, because there are no rules in this middle ground. There's nothing really to help guide us all the way through. Um, That kind of wisdom Paul is going to talk about, and he speaks to the people as wise. Watch what he says. He's going to collect some stories together. It's really beautiful. He's going to string up like a necklace of pearls. The first one is the Lord's Supper. The second one is um, the nation of Israel, the ancient nation of Israel. The the next one is what it was like in Corinth at the time. And then we're going to add a fourth one of what it's like in King County today. This is what he says. Verse 16. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? That word sharing, I want you to underline that in your Bible or note it, because it's the first of four uses of the word koinonia. You may recognize that Greek term. It often means fellowship. This is a Um, On the hard right of the semantic range of that word, it means like active participation, not not passive fellowship, not just like I'm in the area. It's like, no, I'm actively involved. It's the first of four words. It's not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ. It's not the bread, bread which we break a sharing second in the body of Christ. Since there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. So here's the first pearl. We are one with Jesus by our faith. We just celebrated that oneness in actually taking the bread and cup together. We are one with Jesus. And then the second, we are one who are many. We are one because we partake of the We are also one with one another. We are one as a church family. Paul will say that over and over, so that when one suffers, we should all suffer. When one is honored, we're all honored. He's going to get to that in the section on spiritual gifts in the Holy Spirit. We are one as a family. So first two beads, one with Christ, one with each other. Now, watch, ancient Israel. Look at the nation Israel. Are those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? Are they not? Yes, they are. Third use of the word koinonia. When you take a sacrifice to the tabernacle or temple in ancient Israel, you participate in that sacrifice, in the act of worship. Now he's going to drop the hammer. You're one with Christ. You're one with one another. You're one with the sacrifices and temple. Then why would you ever be involved in idolatry where that makes you one with demons, he says? No. What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or is idols anything? No. I say the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to become sharers. Fourth word, with demons. Consider, he links them together. He's leading them some way and then boom, he drops the hammer. Can you understand this? No, no. He's again talking about this first case, going to a temple sacrifice feast. It's inconceivable because it's incompatible. I do not want you to become sharers of the demon. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demon. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of the demon. It's incompatible. You are one with Jesus. When you link yourself to demons, it's incompatible. It works against your true identity. Why would you do that? It doesn't break your identity with Jesus, but it is consequential. It affects it. It diminishes the intimacy that you have with Jesus. Nothing can ever snatch you out of his hand, but your intimacy, your prayer, your worship, your fellowship with him is going to be greatly affected. Do not make the mistake, Corinthians, that your attendance at a temple feast is inconsequential. No, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. 
You cannot do one or the other. Now watch this. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? That's a very Old Testament idea that's repeated in the New. Our, our God is a jealous God. And I want you to know, if you study those uses of that phrase, it's really, really beautiful if you dig. Because our jealous God is jealously protecting and pursuing his daughters and sons. And that's what a good father does. That jealousy lives within a covenant relationship. And that jealous God will move towards errant daughters and sons with discipline. That sharp kind of love, that hard kind of grace that says, I need you to come back with me. Do we work with a jealous God? We do. And his jealousy is perfectly appropriate, not sinful. And he says, we are not stronger than he, are we? No, we are not. Now, he's going to turn their slogan on them yet again. Remember, the cons, that little concentration of people in the church at Corinth are saying, I am free in Jesus. And the gospel has set me free, which is true. That freedom gives me rights. And I demand to use these rights to do whatever I want. So going to idols is no problem. Going to feasts, no problem. And Paul says, no, you are set free in Jesus. But that freedom does not lead you to rights. It leads you to the burden of love for the other person. Love for Jesus and love for those around you, which leads you to build them up and edify them, not destroy them. So this phrase, everything is lawful for me. That's what's like they wore on their T-shirts. Everything is lawful for me. Jesus set me free. I can do whatever. He says, no, that's a terrible, terribly dangerous way to live. So he says, everything is lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify, that build up. Now, this is the verse for you to underline if you're understanding this passage. The very center, verse 24. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Remember I told you these three things? The truth the reality of the fallen world, the spiritual darkness come colliding together. And how does he focus and sharpen them? To the other person, to mission. He says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of the other. That's the focus. And that's where he ends. Now he's going to describe for us this nuanced place of complexities. This is where your three big questions likely live. And it's different than the off and on black and white moral code, yes or no, go or stay, of going to temple feasts. It's different. It's the food that's sold in the marketplace. Watch what he says. Eat anything that is sold in the market without asking questions for conscience. Meat is meat, buy and eat. It's what Gordon Fee says in his commentary, which is good in most places. He says, meat is meat, buy and eat. He says, don't worry about it. We get this. Why do we get that? Well, we get this directly from Jesus. Jesus in his earthly ministry turned much of the Old Testament law, especially the food law, on its head, right? All you had to go is um, Matthew 15. Matthew 15, the Pharisees, those constant troublemakers always on the scene, always around the periphery of Jesus, like watching. What you just do? He's they come to his disciples one time and they're like, you didn't wash your hands correctly. Why do you break the tradition of the elders and not wash your hands correctly? And Jesus says, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of the tradition? He says, what you put in your mouth goes into your stomach and then into the latrine. He says, none of that can make you unclean. What comes out of your heart makes you unclean. And everybody's like, oh. He just turned that on his head, didn't he? What do you got to say about that now, Mr. Pharisee? And they all just kind of went away. Oh, okay. Now we, we connect that to Acts chapter 10. Peter now, the lead head of the disciples in many ways, leader of the Jerusalem church now. In Acts chapter 10, God is making this really clandestine connection with Cornelius, the first big Gentile in his family to believe. And they're going to have like a Gentile Pentecost at his house. It's going to be amazing. But in order to get Peter there, he's in a different place and he has this vision. And the sheet comes out of heaven. And in the sheet are all these unclean animals like shrimp and pig. <sighs> Bacon wrapped shrimp right there on the edge. And God in heaven says to Peter, take and eat. And he goes, never, 
unclean. And then he goes up, he comes down a second time, take and eat. He goes, no, I'm a Jew, ain't doing that. Goes home a third time, take and eat. He's like, never. And he's like, why are you calling unclean what I call clean? I have just declared all foods clean. He's like, oh. And then he relates that to Gentiles and he goes. Now we take that and that. We take Jesus and we take Peter and we come here to Paul and he says in chapter eight, food can't con commend you to God. You're not any the worse if you don't eat. You're not better if you do. And so he's applying that principle based on the Psalm 24, which he quotes and says, everything belongs to God. He created it all. Meat is meat, buy and eat. Don't worry about it. But there's a wisdom aspect to this. Eat anything that is sold in the marketplace without asking questions for conscience sake, for... The earth is the Lord's and all that contains, verse, uh, Psalm 24. Uh, if any one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go to their house to eat, um, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions. You don't got to say, hey, can you tell me the name of the cow and whether they were happy or not? Did they go to Aphrodite? Did they eat grain or just grass? Um, that's all fine, but you don't have to ask those questions in the Corinthian day. You especially don't have to, did this pass through the Apollo temple or the Aphrodite temple or the Ares temple or whatever? Because I'm not sure about that. He says, no, meat is meat, buy and eat. Eat what's set before you. But, watch. If anyone says to you, this meat is sacrificed to idols, do not eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you, and for conscience sake. I mean, not your own conscience, but the other man's. He says, watch, there's a place for wisdom here. There's a place for wisdom. You must learn how to walk with wisdom in many of the decisions that you have to make in this life. So he sets, if you understand this, you understand all of these three chapters. He sets two realities um, not, not opposed to each other, but at the end of almost like a spectrum. Two realities for the Corinthian. The first one, we've hit this horse many times, right? It's really dead. And that's attending an, an idol feast. No, never, never justifiable. But the other one is buying meat in the marketplace. He says, many times it's totally fine, but there are cases where it may not be fine. What? helps make the decision, wisdom. I'm speaking to you as to wise women and men. My beloved, walk in wisdom. Now we're gonna finish this text and then we're gonna really work in application because he says this really fascinating, it's the hardest part of the text right at the end, at the end of verse 29. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? You notice the change in pronouns? Now he's talking about me and my, he uses the first person singular, whereas he's been using second person plural, you all, that's Texan for you plural, all y'all, okay? Uh, and now he makes it very, very personal. So this sounds like they may have been attacking Paul for his own walk in wisdom. So why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? That's not how it should be. I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? He says, I'm going to let those questions hang out there for the sake of this argument because I've already answered them. In chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, in chapter 9, verse 12, in chapter 9, verse 18, I do everything I can for the sake of the other person, even sacrificing my own freedoms. I have become a slave to all. Why? So that I might save all. There is nothing that I wouldn't willingly lay down and sacrifice that is, is freely mine um, for the sake of another person. In fact, in Romans, he, he says, I would even choose to myself be accursed. It's not possible because he's in Christ. For the sake of Israel, if they would be saved, I would go to hell instead of them. That's a powerful statement from Paul. He says, I am willing to lay anything down because it's not what is mine, but it's the other person that's important. 
So it becomes very, very personal to him. He says, whether we eat or drink, let's do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or the church of God. And then he says, I myself please all men. That's nuanced against Galatians 1, where he uses the same word. If I please all men there, if I please all men, if I'm a people pleaser, then I'm not a, a, a servant, a bond servant of Jesus. So he's not just doing what people say. He's saying, I, I want to serve others in all things so that I might save some. So how do we do this? How do we break it down? Well, there's one big question to ask when you're wrestling with these three things that are top of mind, okay? The first big question is this. It's like a diagnostic thing. We'll put them up on the screen in a second, but not now, okay? The first big question is this thing that I'm wrestling with in front of me. Is it an obedience issue or is it a wisdom issue? Is it going to a temple feast obedience issue? Easy. Don't do it, right or wrong, yes or no, A or B, go or stay. Or is it a meat in the marketplace issue? Does it require wisdom? If it is an obedience issue, there is only one answer. Obey. Do or do not what God tells you to do or do not. It's very simple. It will not be easy. It is never easy. Obedience is never easy, but it is simple. And if it's a wisdom issue, then the questions proceed. I would submit to you this first question. What best honors Jesus? First question. In a wisdom decision in the complexities of life, what way best honors Jesus? Second question. What will best edify the other person in Jesus? Third, what will best testify to my identification with Jesus. So these are the diagnostic questions. We'll put them up on the screen. The first big thing is the difference between whether it's an obedience issue or a wisdom issue. Which one is it? Is it an obedience issue or a wisdom issue? If it's a wisdom issue, first question next. What best honors Jesus? Second question, what best edifies the other person? Third, what best testifies to my identification with Jesus? This is at least a start. This is directly from Paul. This is at least a start in how we walk out a practical wisdom. And you can do this at any age. You don't have to pass a driving test or be a legal voter to have this kind of wisdom. You can do it in the back right corner as students. You can do it even younger. And it will equally be as hard if you're in your 80s and 90s. This is difficult to do. This is difficult to do. So my big idea is not something that I want to teach you for today. It's a prayer. It's a simple prayer. And the, the prayer is this. Jesus, give me your wisdom in my journey for the sake of the lost, and for your glory. That's the big idea in the form of a prayer. Can you say that with me? Can you read it and say it with me? Jesus, give me your wisdom in my journey for the sake of the lost and for your glory. One more time, indulge me. Jesus, give me your wisdom in my journey for the sake of the lost and for your glory. That is what I want you to hold on to when you leave because that is how you gain wisdom. James, the brother of Jesus, says in his book, verse five, chapter one, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask the Father, and he gives it generously. He gives it generously. Seek wisdom, pray for it, then walk in it. It is, yes, competency in the complexities of life, but it's the ability to Jesus riff when life gets really nuanced. And that's where many of those decisions that you identified live. Remember when Jesus sent out the 12? He does it in all of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He sends out the 12 on a mission and he tells them a couple things. He says, speak exactly as I speak. For a rabbi to send out his disciples, they never had the freedom to sort of paraphrase. They never had freedom to, to um, kind of, oh, well, this is, he said something like this. He says, no, that's never how it was with rabbis and disciples. They repeated word for word, they practiced and memorized it. So when they went out to preach the gospel, they did it word for word as Jesus did. He says, but when you go, wear sandals, but don't take an extra cloak. Don't take a money bag with you. 
Don't take extra food for your journey. He goes, depend on God as you go. Why would he tell him to do that? Because this is not living in the realm of black and white moral code, obedience to God's law, yes or no, right or wrong, go or stay. It's not that. It's in this complex area. And he wanted them to gain the kind of Jesus wisdom that will guide them the rest of their life. He's doing the same with you. He's doing the same with me. He's doing the same with reach. He is sending us out. Remember, truth, the reality of darkness crashing together, sending us out into mission. How do we do that well? We walk in wisdom and we pray, Jesus, give me your wisdom in my journey for the sake of the lost and for your glory. I want you to pray that. I hope that you pray that every day. And I hope and pray that God gives you answers, wise, wise answers to those three things that we identified at the beginning. Let me pray for you. Father, we bless you. We love you. We thank you. We are desperate for you like air. We are lost without you. And we may add, we are completely lost without your wisdom, without your guidance, without your spirit in us, without your word, without your church body around us. So speak, give us wisdom. We need it in these areas. We must have it in order to represent you well and glorify you well and edify the other person and testify to our identification with you. We love you. Please help us. Please help us. And I pray for every heart in the room and those three things that they brought up at the beginning of our time together that you would speak directly into each one of those situations and scenarios and relationships. Give them wisdom. Give them your wisdom so that they navigate those very complex waters really, really well for your glory and for the sake of the lost. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.